Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, I have the distinct honor. I mean, this is the first time I've actually interviewed somebody like Antonio G G Galloni, um, which I just told you who he was, but he's a critic. And being a fellow critic, I thought it'd be really cool to, to kind of pick his brain and kind of get to know him better. Um, so Antonio, kind of tell us who you are and how did you get to doing what you do? <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. I'll try to match your energy, although it's going to be pretty hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I review wine for work, for a living. I right, have a company yeah. called Venice mm -hmm. that I uh, uh, founded 11 years ago tomorrow with a few of my friends. Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah. And yeah. Um, before that, I worked for Robert Parker for mm -hmm. about seven years. And it's just something that happened, I don't know, out of nowhere. I mean, I went to school for music. I went to school for business. I studied everything <laughs> other than wine. But my parents had a wine shop when I was a kid. I grew okay. up around it. And maybe it just sort of rubbed off on me like a lot of kids. I was super rebellious. I said, I'm never going to do what my parents do. <laughs> <laughs> and after studying all these other things, I ended up writing about wine. It's a great irony of life. But yes, I just, you know, what I did was I, I just started writing about wine to keep track of things that I liked okay. for myself, you know. And that's how it basically started way back when, when you used to, before there were smartphones and things like that, you'd peel the label off a bottle and whatever. And uh, I just started keeping track of wines that I liked for me mm -hmm. and uh, in a little book. And then maybe if I was out to dinner with some friends and they we would have some wine and they would ask me what I thought, I would sort of explain the wine in my view and people found that helpful. And so I just, I guess I realized that I had a an inclination towards kind of tasting a wine and breaking it down into little parts and then okay. sort of reconstructing that and explaining it to people in a way that's easy. So it just started off really as a as a something fun that just gradually grew and grew and grew. It went from being just keeping track of wines I liked to actually writing, you know, full descriptors to then going and visiting regions and then to then publishing my first newsletter on Piedmont wines. That was in 2004. Then I met Robert Parker after that. So it just kind of grew, but it all grew out of just a real, just something for fun. That's similar to Robert Parker's path. Yeah. Kind of, you know, he he just was an enthusiast and had his newsletter for quite a few years and similar path. Um, I, I, I just told him that, you know, mine is about my studies and it's a, so a different kind of path. Um, but another thing besides that we have an Italian heritage, um, I also went to school for music. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but... Uh, but I didn't, but my parents, my parents were not involved in the wine industry at all. Matter of fact, we didn't really drink a lot of wine uh, growing up. So it's a little bit different being an Italian focused family and not having wine as a central thing. Um, but uh, my both, both sides of my family were involved in the newspaper industry. So oh, wow. I kind of have the media bug, if you will, uh, with that. Um, so yeah, so you, you kind of did that. And so you met Robert Parker, like, how did that happen where that you got into working for him and then moving on to your own deal? Well, I think life comes down to making the right decision at the right critical moment. Okay. And also being a little lucky. Yes. <laughs> so I uh, was going to business school and uh, I went to business school wanting to learn the foundations of finance because I had worked, I had studied music and then because of a bunch of bizarre coincidences, but I grew up speaking a lot of different languages. And so when a girlfriend that I had wanted me to get a serious job, I started doing temp jobs in Boston. And then that led to to a lot some opportunities around my language skill set. And then I ended up having this kind of unexpected career in finance, but I didn't really know much about finance. <laughs> so then well, I got to get serious here. I got to go to school and learn this. So I went to business school thinking, okay, I'm going to learn about finance. I just come from living three years in Italy where I had been in Piedmont all the time, tasting wine and all this other stuff, entertaining clients. And I just started writing about wine for fun. And so then I had this little newsletter and I knew enough to know that I should separate my newsletter from me personally. Mm -hmm you know, which we do in the United States with incorporation. And I didn't, but I didn't know any of this detail. And so I had my class schedule was completely full, but I looked to see when the business uh, class was going to be talking about business structures. Okay. And so I went to this class that I wasn't registered in. So that, so I went to a lecture that I wasn't in a class I wasn't registered in, which is kind of unlike me, but I, I, I did that anyway. I said, well, they're going to talk about 
business structures on this day. So I went to that class and I sat in on this lecture and this, I went to a business school is very academic and to me too much removed from the real world. In other words, there were a lot of professors who never had real jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I respect that for the accomplishment because this is a pretty elite place, but it doesn't resonate with me as much as somebody who's actually doing things. So I go to this business law class and the guy who's teaching the business law class is a venture capitalist who's not an academic, who's actually doing things and implementing these things that he's telling you about, C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, all these things. He's actually you know, doing this stuff. And so I was just really inspired because it was such a so different from everything else. And so afterwards, after the lecture, I went up to just thank this person for this lecture, which is also unlike me because I'm a really shy person. <laughs> so I was not like the class pet or the head of the class government or any of these things. I was very to myself. So it was out of character. But I, I was so inspired that I thought, I just want to thank this person because it's really been great. So I go up and I just start, I just say, hey, I just want to thank you for the lecture. It was great. And he starts asking me questions about what I do. And, and I went to the school where the professors are always busy. They never have time for the students. If, I mean, if you want to see somebody, you have to go to their office hours and book yeah. a slot. And it's very regimented. And so I didn't expect that we'd start this conversation because that never happened to me before. It's always, you know, my office hours are Tuesdays from two to four. So, so I go, so we start chatting and he said, well, what are you working on? And I said, well, I've got this wine newsletter. And his response to me is like, oh, my best friend runs the, the website for Robert Parker. <laughs> Let me introduce you. <laughs> it was so random, so bizarre. And so within a few weeks, I had my interview with Robert Parker the first time. And then I was in school and I was young and stupid. And I thought, well, if Robert Parker thinks I'm good, he offered me a job right away. And I thought, well, if Robert Parker thinks I'm good enough to do this on my own, I don't, I can do it on my own without him. And that was a stupid reaction, but. I didn't know how hard it was, but basically the first time he offered me a job, I said no, because I wanted to be on my own. And then life changed because then um, I had my first child and I was working a corporate job and trying to write this newsletter and it was just too overwhelming. So I thought, why don't I just call Bob and see if this job is still around? So I called him and he wasn't, he was out. He called me right back. And he said, I was hoping when I saw your message that this is what it was about. And we did this deal on the phone in like, I don't know, a minute, maybe. It was like very nice. quick. And that was in 2006. I started working for Robert, for, for Robert Parker doing Italy, Italian wines and the Wine Advocate. And then I just added regions over the years after that. I also love champagne. So in 2008, I, I, did, I started champagne. And then that just sort of grew. But it all came from sort of trusting your instinct in a particular moment to do something that's really out of character in a set of settings that are not at all normal for me because these were not right. my usual things. I did not talk to professors. I did not, was never that outgoing, you know, but it just, it just goes to show that like, you know, these opportunities come along, they can really change your life, mm -hmm. but you have to go for it. Yeah. You know, like the opportunity is there, so that's good, but you also have to grab it. Absolutely. And that's you, that's on you. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, um, but it was just a fluke. It was just a fluke of a lot of different things that happened kind of at the same time. Okay. Uh, just real quick, because your microphone's probably oh. about to fall off. So. No, that's good. We don't want to ruin the audio. <laughs> we'll so, make yeah, an in-course adjustment. All right, we're good. We're getting excited so, here. Um, so, yeah, so you're with One Advocate for a while, and then you went out on your own. So yeah. what was, was that kind of like the, it's time for you to fly moment, or you just... Uh, you just decided, you know, it was a good, good idea or because you've been very successful with it. So, well, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> you know, there came a juncture where, where Bob decided to sell his business mm -hmm. and it was my hope based on all of our previous conversations that he would sell it to me, but he decided he didn't want to sell it to me. Okay. He wanted to sell it to somebody else. And that's, you know, life is like that. So you get to this point where there's kind of like a crossroads and you're sort of thinking, well, you know, I can either go and work as part of this organization with these new owners who I didn't know and I had no uh, I had no relationship with them. I didn't know them. I didn't know what they were going to do. Or maybe this is the time to do something on my own. And, and that was just another one of those moments where you just sort of get to a fork in the road and and you're obligated to make a choice. Right. And I would say probably both of them are scary. One is a lot scarier. And so therefore I knew... It's like, you know that that's what you have to do, but it's really scary. It's really yeah. damn scary. You're like, okay, this is it. Now I've got to go and do this on my own. 
And, you know, there's that saying, right? One door opens and another one, one door closes, another one opens. Yeah, exactly. And it yeah. just felt like it was just time for that change. And okay. these uh, inflection points in life are terrifying. And yet I just felt it had to be done. So that was in 2013. 2013 early okay. 13 yeah i mean i i don't have the exact same situation but you know i was in restaurants for a while and at some point i turned sour to restaurants and i wanted to stay in the industry and i the situation was hey it's not working out it was really a mutual conversation and it was like well how about the end of the year we part ways and I didn't have anything at the time. And so I was doing anything, anything I could to figure out what I wanted to do. This particular thing, while it did start also at a time that I left a job uh, in restaurants, I wasn't necessarily ready to commit to doing this as my job. Um, though it would have been nice. It would have been cool if it somehow in a few months things had, had worked out, but I never treated this. I treat it like a job, but I don't, treat it like it's my how I make a living um whatever works but yeah so I ended up in the retail side of things you know and I even I even decided I was going to go to Provine I didn't have a job I had some money I went to Provine for for the show but at the at the also the idea of like if I don't have a job by March then maybe I can find something through. Uh, but luckily, I, I've landed in a great place. I don't talk about my actual employer. I'll tell you who I work for later. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful place I work for. And, and it's been, you know, it was scary. Uh, I also took a big pay cut. Um, so it's scary in a lot of sense. But I think it was, for me, the best decision I probably have made in a very long time. So it's a little different than your thing. But it's still scary because going on your own, I mean, that's that's a lot, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like you had your confidence because you had you at least saw you had you had some experience there. So you at least knew what you at least you had an idea, right? Yeah. yeah. When I started this, I was just like, well, so-and-so is doing it. I'll just do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, you have know? to be, I mean, you, you know, you have to also, I think it's really important if you're surrounded by a group of people who can be supportive yes. because it's very difficult to do a major life change like that on your own. I mean, nobody really does that. So you have a lot of this, your ecosystem of people and yeah, it was good. Yeah. And it turned out well, but I mean, it was definitely a scary moment. Right. Oh, I can imagine that. So now we have Venice. Yeah. You have Venice. I don't yeah. know part of it. Um, you have Venice and that's expanded some more. Like you have yeah. other people that are now yeah. uh, working for you. Um, do you still kind of specialize in anything or um, basically how, how are you involved with it versus anyone else that's now working for you? Yeah. I mean, so I, I the first thing is I don't ever take a view that anybody works for me okay. because we work for our customers, you know, in okay. the sense that, you know, this is a, a, a subscription-based business principally. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do events and other things, but basically the the person you work for is your customer. You know, I was taught that at a really young yeah. age in business that basically the, the boss is a customer. So I don't, you know, when everybody says, well, I want to work for you, I'm like, nobody works for me. Everybody works for our customers. And so we just made a choice to hire really great people, mm -hmm. hire the best writers that we can, Okay. to put out the best editorial product that we can. Um, I mean, my main regions of focus are, um, well, today we tasted some Italian wine. So some parts of Tuscany and Piedmont in Italy, we have Eric Guido who does the rest of Italy mm -hmm. really well. Um, in California, I do Napa and Sonoma and Santa okay. Barbara. And then Eric does uh, Paso Robles and other parts of the Central Coast. Um, Eric does Oregon and Washington. Uh, I've got a, a Joaquin Hidalgo in Buenos Aires who does all of South America and Spain. Now, more recently, Neil Martin lives in London and he does Bordeaux, Burgundy, uh, and, uh, Beaujolais and a bunch of other places, South Africa that he loves. Anne Krabiel is a master of wine. She does Germany, Alsace, Austria, and parts of Champagne. Rebecca Gibb is also a master of wine. She does New Zealand, the Loire. Uh, and I've got Alessandro Maznaghetti who does our maps. Uh, we've got all these custom California maps that we do. Yeah. And, uh, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. Oh, well, yeah. Nicholas Greinacher joined us recently to do the Rhone okay, and he's cool. been doing a great job. And then I've got Angus Hewson in Australia for Australia, which is, we then uh, us poor Americans think of Australia as a country, but it's essentially a continent. So it's right, yeah. vast. <laughs> 
And so we've got a great team. And so, yeah, my, the regions that I still cover uh, are, are parts of Tuscany and Piedmont in Italy, that Cal- California block I mentioned, I do Champagne, mm-hmm. I do Bur- Bordeaux and a little bit of Burgundy. And those are the main regions. Okay. Um, and then we've got, you know, new people joining and we've got somebody right now who's kind of in our training program. And I'm really excited about, about him as well. So it's just, um, the goal is really to hire really the, the best people and to okay. let them do their thing. I mean, in a, a lot of ways, this model for Venice is very much like the model that Bob had at the Wine Advocate circa 2006, which is hire the best people, let them do their job. The The, the challenge is that, that it sounds great, but that requires some management. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't necessarily always interested in that. So it's kind of like that is the kernel, but then you have to sort of, some people need um, guidance at different stages and and uh, a, a little bit of a safety net perhaps at times. Mm-hmm. And so that's the whole job of managing okay. people. But the goal is to really let people do their own thing cool. and to hire really great people. Cool. We'll talk maps later because I'm I have a big project on Google Earth. So I may need, want to talk to your guy about some ideas okay. um, to help me. Not, okay. not, 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 I mean, not necessarily for you guys, but um, anyway. Uh, yeah. So let's briefly talk about uh, the class that you did. So Vino Nobile to Montepulciano. I actually heard someone on the, on the elevator on the way up say Montepulciano. So, I mean, even within our industry, and it could have been a mis- he could have been misspeaking to someone on the phone. I mean, it's so easy to, 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 to flip these two words all the time. Um, what were some highlights for you uh, with the tasting? Um, maybe with some of the questions that you got, uh, type of thing, or you know what what's what separates this maybe from some of the other areas of Tuscany? Well, I so this is an interesting region because it's a very historic region. Mm-hmm. But Vino Nobile di, Mon- di Montepulciano often gets mixed up with Montalcino, or right people confuse <laughs> Montepulciano with Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. Right, different. Yeah, so uh, it's a region that I've always loved because it's historic and I love things that are historic. This is the first appellation to be DOCG in Italy and the wines are Sangiovese based and I picked all the wines for the seminar so it's hard to say that and there's a, a favorite or two. I, I think what I did like is what I do like here is that these wines have moved away from the style of like even the 2000s when their wines were really oaky and rich mm-hmm. and kind of anonymous right. towards wines that have a greater transparency of place. Okay. And to me, all the great wines of the world are wines of place. Um, you could have some exceptions, of course, but you know, if you look at all of Burgundy, Germany, Alsace, Piedmont, uh, even all of the vineyard designate wines that we find in the United States in places like Santa Barbara or Sonoma, and there's more and more single vineyard wines from Napa, the whole concept is we're going towards a greater definition of place. Mm-hmm. So to me, this is very important. And you can't, you're going to lose some of that if you throw all sorts of new French oak and vanilla on these delicate right, yeah. fruit flavors and earthy flavors. So to me, the highlight was really just seeing, wow, you know, these wines have, I mean, you never know. I mean, you pick the wines, you hope they're going to show well, but today they were showing really well. And it was just the expression of Sangiovese, which is the main grape in the Appalachian. And, uh, you know, Sangiovese, and we talked about it in the seminar, also Nebbiolo, which is in Piedmont. These grapes, for whatever reason, they don't work very well outside of their natural habitats. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but you know you can take Merlot and you can make really good Merlot in a lot of parts of the world, and or Cabernet Sauvignon or mm-hmm. Syrah or even Pinot Noir. But these Italian varieties like Sangiovese and Nebbiolo and others, they just don't work so well outside of their natural habitat. And so it's really fun to say, I'm going to spend an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm just going to really deep dive into this one place. I'm going to taste, I think there were 14 wines today, which is a lot for tasting like this. One grape, uh, fairly narrow set, set of vintages, and just really focus on how distinctive each wine is. So I, I think that the more, the highlight, the big takeaway for me was maybe not so much any single wine, but just how different each wine is. And that's really what I'm looking for. If I put together a tasting of 10 wines, of 12 wines, 14 wines, whatever it is, is that each wine has a a reason for being there and that they have a story and that they're distinctive from the wine that you t- just tasted before or you're going to taste just after. So that's really what I'm looking for. And that's what I thought was really fun about this tasting was just seeing how many different wines you can make in a place that's relatively small. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that what you said in that seminar, you know, about how Italian varieties don't seem to do very well outside of Italy. I mean, it made me think about that because, yeah, you, you have 
people around the world that are growing certain varieties. In Texas, there's quite a few people are growing Italian varieties, Sangiovese, uh, Montepulciano and Abruzzo, um, not really so much Nebbiola, but th those two, but then um, Alianico. Um, some of it makes sense for, say, the Southern Italian things or things that maybe are better suited to the climate of Texas, though. Have to remind people that we are a very big state and it's not just one climate of hot, though it feels like that most of the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of the examples from, from Texas and I can't say that I'm like, oh, wow, it's a, this is just like taste. I mean, it should never be exactly like the other place, but sometimes I'm kind of like, I don't know if this is what I expect out of that grape. Yeah. Um, whereas with, you know, the a lot of the French varieties, they seem to retain their character or no matter what country they're, they're from. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, I had a, had a Merlot from Texas and, um, it's actually today's video, uh, from the eclipse party. So if you didn't watch the eclipse party video, you need to watch it. Um, and the person's uh, winery, I tasted the wine and I was like, this is Merlot. Like I would never mistake it for anything else. Um, would I call it Texas Merlot? I don't know, but um, but yeah. So I think that was kind of interesting that you made that point. Um, and I just found I just found that this this class was really cool. Um, you definitely had a really great selection of wines that showed some differences among them. Uh, I also happened to have recorded uh, a, a review of the Fresca Baldi <laughs> okay. a couple months ago. And I remarked to the two ladies that were in here uh, earlier, I just quickly glanced at it. And um, one of the, just, I don't necessarily focus on tasty notes, but the word sage popped up. It's like, I said that in the <laughs> review, uh, among a lot of other things. And I actually rewatched the review today, just kind of refresh my memory about, about the region. Um, you talked about the, um, um, the Pieves. Yeah. Okay. So that's coming. Yeah. Um, so, and I, 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 I looked at it in my head. It's kind of like, I guess, whatever the Chianti UGAs or MG, whatever they're calling them. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of something that they're trying to have more sense of a place. Well, I mean, I think that when you have a region like that and they're so month what they've had so far are sort of single vineyard wines, but right. they're not, you know, it's this person's single vineyard wine and that person's single vineyard wine and that person's single vineyard wine. And they're not... We tasted a few. Though. Yeah, and yeah. there's no, like, link... There's no way for, like, average person to sort of, like, link these or group them together. Okay. So they had this study some years ago. They hired some soil scientist or whatever okay. to look at their region. And they said, well, there's these historic sort of church. The church, you know, in medieval time was the center of society, mm -hmm. right? The hub. And so they decided to sort of divide the area into 12 zones okay. based upon these historical parish churches and the mapping of soils around those areas. And so uh, they started, you know, nothing like this happens overnight, especially not, not in Italy. Yeah. So also because any any kind of changes like this now uh, have to also get approved at the, at the EU level. Mm -hmm. So... So there's a whole new step of bureaucracy. If this had happened before the EU, it just would have been an Italian sort of legislation, basically. Okay, yeah. But now, all that stuff still has to be done at the country level, and then it's going to get approved by these different ministers at these, you know, right. higher, you know, sort of EU levels. So basically, you know, we talked about in the seminar that the vino nobile disciplinare, the, di the disciplinare is the... Uh, their production guidelines, 70% mm -hmm. Sangiovese, mm -hmm. which they call Prugnolo Gentile there, 30% mm -hmm. okay? other grapes. Those other grapes can be uh, indigenous grapes, like Colorino, Canaiolo, which you also see in the Chianti Classico, mm -hmm. or they can be international grapes. So the Pieve, what is that? So that is, you're going to take uh, the area, divide it into 12 of these areas based on the parish churches and the soils, and then you're going to introduce. they're going to introduce stricter production guidelines, which means 85% Sangiovese and only 15% other grapes, and the 15% have to be indigenous grapes. Okay. So there's a lot of things that are happening at once. The area is being divided. The percentage of Sangiovese is going up, mm -hmm. and the international varieties are going out. This is kind of similar to what Chianti Classico did. So to push all that through, I mean, that's a, a big lift, you right. know, and what I've been able to do over the last few years is taste some of the early experimental wines that people made to sort of see 
Uh, I mean, because it's all well and good to sort of take a place and divide it, but then, you know, there actually have to be differences in the wines. Otherwise, yeah, right. what's the point? Right? <laughs> so, so I've been fortunate the last few years to sort of taste these trials to, of mm. people saying, okay, this is our conceptually our idea of this wine from this area or that area and to taste them and to see. And I think the next, the first vintage where this is actually going to be, uh, sold is the 21 vintage, which can be marketed starting the beginning of next year. Okay. And so these will be the first sort of properly authorized Pieve wines okay. where you'll see Pieve this, Pieve that, Pieve whatever. And then that will give people also a chance to sort of compare and say, well, let's get three wines from this Pieve and see, uh, is there some commonality or, or not? Yeah. But in your, at the, at the very beginning of something that is going to take generations to figure out. Right especially because these are all old uh, cultures where the production of wine goes back hundreds or thousands of years, hundreds or thousands, not hundreds of thousands, <laughs> hundreds, right, yeah. possibly thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're introducing something with a modern mindset and it's just, it's not like from one day to tomorrow from, you know, from, from one day to the other, yeah. then it's going to be very clear. It's kind of a, like we're living in the time when this is happening. Right. So I find that very exciting, but yeah. it's also kind of inconclusive right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, one the other thing that you mentioned I thought was really interesting is you talked about how um, wine prior to what we're tasting now was different in just the mindset. Um, you know, how uh, whether it was the parents and then the kids or just, you know, even even with the change that's been going on in the region, you know, in the early 2000s, they had they had a certain mindset. Now we're we're shifting to something else. And I thought that was very uh, telling because I guess. Well, I guess I intrinsically know that regions do this. I know a lot of regions really try to stick with tradition, but we talked. You talked also about how everybody sends their stuff to you know to a lab. They they run their labs because you have to. Yeah. And what has that done? That's increased the quality of wine throughout the world. Um, to me, if you can't make a good wine, you probably should, well you probably need to learn more. You know, like I don't have I don't think I can sit there and just all of a sudden make a great wine or grow great grapes. Um, I could learn how to do it, I'm sure. But, um, you know, but I also think that if you don't, if you're not using the tools that are available, then you're just kind of selling yourself short. Yeah. You know? There's a lot of tools now that are available that, yeah. you know, and what I said about the family, about the, about the wineries is, you know, that when I started doing this 25 years ago, I would go and I would meet with these owners yeah. at these estates in different parts of the world. And now, in a lot of those places, it's the kids who are mm -hmm. running those wineries. Right. And those kids, uh, some of them are quite young. I mean, they, they could be in their 20s and 30s. I mean, and, and so their whole vision of the world is, you know, they've grown up with things like smartphones and social media and things that for somebody of my age came along sort of early to mid career. Mm -hmm. They don't know a world without these things. Right. Yeah. Without the internet. They don't, you know without cell phones like this, the, the, that's the only world that they've ever known. And they, they travel more, they taste wines from different places. They're, they're friends mm -hmm. as winemakers are usually pretty social people. Their winemaking friends are likely to be, uh, people from, um, lots of different parts of the world. Right. And so now all of a sudden what the, what winemakers generally do when they go visit is they'll exchange bottles, you know? So like I, I come visit you, I give you a bottle of my wine, give me a bottle of your wine. Right. And so you end up with this collection of all these incredible things and you taste them. And it, of course, it's going to inform you. It's going to inspire you. And some things will, they may sort of set you on a slightly different path. So yeah, I would say that I've seen that in, you know, in the 15 years I've been doing this now, yeah. uh, I started in 2009. Um, not that I was interviewing winemakers that early, but it was pretty early on. And I'm not saying that they didn't taste wines from other regions, but in my conversations with a lot of people, it felt like they were very insul insular, insulated. Yeah. Through, they, they just knew what they did and they didn't necessarily experience the stuff, you know, and me coming from the side of I'm here to sell wine, you know, so I need to, I need to know something about everything. Um, you experience all these different wines. Yeah. Um, so I think it's good to see that uh, with these these newer generations that they're experiencing those things because, I mean, we can learn a lot from, yeah. from other regions. For sure. We don't need to necessarily imitate them, but you can take some of the concepts Absolutely. and improve your own wines. Absolutely. Well, um, 
I don't want to take too much more of your time. I, it's been really gracious. We're almost at half an hour, and I said 15 minutes. Um, so um, is there anything else you want to chat about? No, or it's been great. All right. Thanks for coming today. Yeah. Really nice meeting you. Absolutely. Here. All right, folks, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, just always just click like and subscribe. Tell your friends about it, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.